by the New York Times as the Paul Revere of globalization world. Uh, he's a great speaker. Um, he's co-founder of the Global Exchange. He uh, doesn't like this part. You don't like to hear all the, all the accolades, but uh, you know he's just done a whole lot of really, really powerful things. Uh, green festivals, uh, the ongoing Global Citizen Center. Uh, numerous articles and books, including his two latest books, uh, The Green Festival Reader, Fresh Ideas from Agents of Change, and Building the Green Economy, Success Stories from the Grassroots. It is uh, our distinct pleasure to welcome you, Kevin Donner. So uh, thanks for having me, Susan. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, you notice, like, uh, if, you, if you get a lot of left books, if, you're, if your bookshelves are full of the kind of books that I have, go and look at, take 10 of them off the shelf, and look at the content of what's negative and what's positive, and it's like 95% ain't it awful, system sucks, and then there's a little thing at the end about, we should have a revolution. <laughs> yeah, great, but how? You know, could you give me some instructions? So we've been kind of light on that. So what I try to do is reverse that. I only give you a couple negative slides up at the beginning and then the rest is positive. So first problem is that, and for people that, <laughs> for people that are on the side and can't see, every biological system on this planet is collapsing, mainly through the way we run our economic system, right? It's cut it down, burn it up, throw it away. Well, that can't go on, right? Uh, Species destruction. <laughs> Somebody should write an article saying, there's an animal species that's threatened with extinction right now. And you know, you go along gradually until people guess, oh yeah, that's us, yeah, right. <laughs> we can't, that right now, now, not in the future, now, there are hundreds of species of frogs in Central America that are going extinct because there's a fungus that used to be killed by the cold at night and it's not cold enough anymore. We haven't even named a lot of those. Do we have the right, as one species among many, to be destroying hundreds of other species before we even get acquainted with them? You know, it's one thing if you get to know somebody and you hate them and then you kill them, you know? <laughs> but if you don't even know them, eh, it's kind of cheesy, you know? <laughs> topsoil eroding, we lose about two billion, with a B, tons of topsoil a year in this country. We were blessed with very thick topsoil, but it won't last forever. The Ogallala Aquifer, which is the underground millennial lake underneath the Midwest of the United States. You can see the maps. It's being tapped out. Poor farmers can't afford drilling to keep following it. The, the family farm gets taken over by the big corporate farm. <laughs> Machine intensive, compacts the soil, lots of chemicals. <laughs> you know, we're, we're literally committing ecocide and suicide. Deforestation, so, uh, CO2 levels. Right? I say to people, Miami and Houston are going to go underwater. And they go, what? Really? No, nah, you're making that up. That's if we stopped all the factories and cars right now. Miami and Houston, don't, don't buy coastal property, you know? It's, it's, it's not good for your kids' sake, okay? This is a chart, and I'll explain this. This is 420,000 years of ice core data that correlates CO2 concentrations in the environment and temperature and ocean level, in this case, it's temperature rise. If the temperature of the planet goes up an average of five degrees, we're done. National Geographic did a film, a documentary called Five Degrees, and they do, let's see what happens to the planet with one degree rise, then two degrees, three. By the time they get to three degrees, you're, you're kind of checking your sphincter for is it tight enough to not poop in your pants, you know? You get to five, we're done. So if you look at this 420,000 years of data, the red line is CO2 levels, and it stays with a, in a band of between 180 parts per million and uh, 300 parts, and now it's getting up close to 400. It's up here. It's way outside the band. You people know about TED.com, TED.com? Go on TED.com and put in the search box glaciers. And you'll get this guy, James Baylog, he's a National Geographic photographer. He set up time-lapse cameras at all the major glaciers in the world, and he shows you three years of glacial melt in 30 seconds. And it's like a river flowing, okay? So we're really, like, setting ourselves up for disaster. Second problem is political and economic. 
The elites who control policy making, both in our own country and globally, I've written a bunch of books about the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, it's very boring stuff, but when you examine it, you realize these guys are disconnected. They don't ride the bus, okay? <laughs> in, in San Francisco, our bus system, Muni, the guy who runs it gets about $200,000 a year and a car. They give him a car. <laughs> you give him a bus pass, okay? Don't give him a car. I asked, I asked a Muni driver friend of mine, why do you do that? He said, oh, that's so we'll get to work on time. Yeah, great. <laughs> Very funny. So the solutions are going to have to come from us. People riding in limousines with security guards are not going to solve our problems. It's up to us, okay? So all of this yammering about, Obama, I'm disillusioned. Hey, you have to be illusioned to be disillusioned, okay? <laughs> So if you were illusioned to think that Bill Clinton or George Bush or Obama or God or whoever was going to fix your problems, that's lazy, okay? It's spiritually lazy. <laughs> so there's a structural flaw in the system. Transnational corporations are not rooted in place. No place is home. <laughs> Look what they did with our manufacturing sector. It's all in China. Thank you very much, right? Those good union jobs that you could get right out of high school, those, those aren't there anymore unless you're some little computer whiz guy, which we got a lot of them in this area, we're lucky. So they're not rooted in place, they're not democratically organized, it's a dictatorship, and they destroy nature. A 2,000-year-old redwood tree is not a gift of the creator to be preserved for future generations to appreciate. It's $250,000 worth of lumber on the lumber market, so you kill it. A fish swimming alive in the water has no value. It's only when you kill it and turn it into a marketable commodity. That will destroy the biological basis of our existence. Look at the data on fish, the good fish, the cod, the haddock, the salmon, you know, the pilchards, the ones that we've been eating for many, many generations. The data is just going like that. They're just being wiped out, right? They're not. But in the places where people have done conservation and imposed, we had two seasons of salmon fishing in the San Francisco Bay Area where the salmon fishermen themselves said, no fishing this year. We got to let the salmon recover. And lo and behold, the little boogers recovered. Yeah. You just got to back off and leave them alone and stop killing them. You know? Oh, I love my meat. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. It's murder. So the triple bottom line, I mean, just think about this. You know, I, I'm a weekend, uh, a weekend, you know, no, a weekday vegetarian, you know, like if somebody puts the uh, fish or something like that, I'll, I'll eat it to be polite and all. But think, imagine if everybody who eats meat had to kill the meat they eat. That's all. Take a chicken and wring its neck right in front of you, tear its head off and see the blood come squirting out and then sit down for a nice chicken dinner. Yeah. Uh, that might change things, you know. <laughs> dams? Oh, yeah, no, dams, and that's why dams are being taken down in a lot of places around the world. There's a whole global movement about it, uh, Restore Rivers Network. Um, triple bottom line is going to kick ass on the single bottom line. Single bottom line is just money, right? Money, money, profit, profit, and the hell with the social environmental impact. A triple bottom line economic model, which is now being taught in more and more MBA schools, it's at the Green Festivals, it's at Investor Circle, Social Venture Network, Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, Social Capital Network, etc. All about creating an enterprise model that does social justice, environmental restoration, and profitability. When you can make greater profit saving the environment than destroying it, that's a different rule book. That's a tipping point. You're into a different kind of system. And that's the transition we're in. This environmental crisis creates opportunities for us to provide better solutions. We should be solutionaries, not revolutionary, because that's got a violent kind of undertone to it, blowing up banks and things. Although, eh. <laughs> whenever I say the words Bank of America, <coughs> I always spit. Um, but check out Climate Capitalism, new book by Hunter Lovins, and they go around the world looking at all the different ways in which people are making better profits saving the environment than destroying it, right? We're, we're at a tipping point, so we're becoming solutionaries. The solutionary movement is if we can unify the fair trade movement, the green economy movement, the intentional community movement, the transition towns, Via Campesina, the largest peasant organization, it's got Latin American peasant groups 
family farmer groups, including U.S. family farmers, all linked together saying, hey, we got to fight these big global corporations because their model is an extractive model. The only reason Walmart comes into your town is to take out more money than they put in. Otherwise, why would they do it? You know, it's not a charity, right? It's an extractive model. It's a colonial model. And we were all against colonialism, I hope. Climate change movement, local control. And there's a mass of books, as witnessed by these wonderful folks, the bookstore down there. So we're in the early stages of the first ever global revolution. Every revolution up until now was a national revolution where the revolutionaries sought to gain control in the capital city to run that country differently. When the Zapatistas rose up in southern Mexico in 1994, they did not rise up saying we want to take control of Mexico City and run this country differently. They rose up against a particular corporate economic model that was destroying their forests and starving their children. And they said, we'd rather die on our feet than live on our knees. The Mexican military had the military ability to destroy the Zapatistas. The reason they couldn't do it was because all around the world, people like Global Exchange, we went right down to the Mexican consulate, put about 30 people in there and sat down in their furniture and on their floors and wall, you know, hallways and said, you're not getting your office back until you call Mexico City and tell your government to pull those troops back. They even had banks pressuring them. No, 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 massacre is not the way to go. We want to do business here. And they couldn't destroy the Zapatistas. And the Zapatistas touched off this notion of, no, it's a global values revolution. It's not just about seizing power in the capital city. So if you go to any culture in the world and you say, which is sacred, life or commerce, people are not going to say commerce. Commerce is a thing we do, okay? It's like sport, religion, sex. Sex might be in a separate category, but you know what I mean. It's something we do. It's not what we're about, okay? Life is what we are, what we're about. It's what links us all. This is the LOHAS market, Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. It's old data. These numbers would be bigger now, but you can see ecological lifestyle, 81 billion. Sustainable economy, 76 billion. Alternative health care, 30 billion. You people are in here somewhere, right? That nice uh, organic uh, yoga mat you bought or, you know, the organic food you feed your kids or whatever. I raised two kids. I made sure <laughs> what kind of chemicals I'm putting into my kids. That's child abuse, right? It's nutritional child abuse if you don't read the, oh, if I can't pronounce it, it's got eight syllables and I have a PhD, I don't want to feed that to my kid, right? <laughs> this economy, this green economy is huge and it is growing rapidly. If you look at the annual growth rates in green building products, health and beauty aids, organic cotton, organic foods, they're all cranking at a growth rate that's greater than the rest of the economy, which is in the trash. And it's based on a very simple notion, two simple notions. As the environment gets destroyed, the profitability of saving natural resources goes up. And as mass education, internet, right, think, the history of human communication had two forms, one-to-one, -one, and phones were one-to-one, -one, and then with radio and TV, you had one-to-many. Now we have many-to-many, -many, and many-to-many -many creates creativity and sharing. And it could be funny cat movies, LOL, you know, <laughs> which a lot of it is, God help us, you know. But, but, as my friend Sandra says, but, think what's going on is the creation of global brain. Anybody can now connect with anybody else. We have about three billion handheld devices. You're going to be able soon to shoot the barcode of a product and stream a video interview with the worker who made that product. You'll be able to lay it down and have a hologram, a three-dimensional hologram of that worker step up onto, the, onto your, your uh, cell phone and say, yeah, when we made this product here that you're going to buy, hopefully, you know, uh, 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 explain it. In our stores, in our global exchange stores, we'll have, there's, every product is two products. There's the soapstone candle holder from Kenya, and then there's the story of the handicapped youth group that made that and what they're going to do with your money. People will pay more for that. So the kind of consumer that's interested in the backstory is the more well-educated consumer, which tends to be the higher income consumer. It's a great market segment. So again, you see the green of money and the green of nature starting to come together and synergize. Green investing is paying off. This is from Business Week. In the early months of 2009, the green mutual funds were growing at, by three times the rate of the uh, uh, S&P index. 
eco-focused exchange traded funds. These are index where you can vote, you can put your money just in wind energy or just in solar energy or whatever, and they spread it across all the companies. It's in double digits. Private sector invested 2.4 trillion in green investment since 2007. That 2.4 trillion, that's a lot of money. That's like almost as much as we spend on killing people, you know? Uh, with 865 U.S. military bases outside our country, 240 military golf courses that we're all paying for. Do we really need 240 military golf courses? I mean, really, come on. You know, it's like that military music is to music as military justice is to justice, you know, something like that. There's actually a book by that title. Organic food, it turns out organic food from all these scientific studies, it's more nutritional, it's more beneficial, and it's more profitable. Food is a great political issue for you to focus on because what's good for you as an individual being is good for the community and it's good for the planet. You get a nice coincidence of interest, right? A lot of this you guys know. Green energy is taken off in 2007. The U.S., Spain, and China each added more wind capacity than the world added nuclear power, and the U.S. added more wind capacity than it added coal-fired capacity during the previous five years. So the coal-fired power plants ain't happening. Coal-fired power plants are probably the single worst thing for climate change. If you want to do some political activism, get involved in Coal Swarm or 350.org or one of the groups that's fighting against coal-fired power plants. They are absolutely the worst. Uh, this is solar energy. Now, I want to point out something. You see how solar energy photovoltaic in the U.S., it's only less than 4% of our total energy. And that's what the naysayers always point out. Oh, it's so small. No, but look at the growth curve. What you want is you want a market segment that isn't already saturated and is growing at a rapid rate because capital investment is all about what's my return? Is it 2% or 10%? <laughs> I'm going to tend to go for the 10% as long as it's legal, you know, maybe even if it's not legal. You know. And marijuana is legal in this state, so please. Those of you who are from out of state, welcome to California. <laughs> There's actually a, a bill working its way through the state legislature, which Jerry Brown will probably sign, at least I hope he will, to make industrial hemp production legal in four counties down in the south. Way overdue. Hemp is the closest thing to petroleum for the range of products you can get from it, which is maybe why it's been suppressed. Maybe the oil industry doesn't like it. What killed nuclear power is capitalism. During the Bush administration, Georgie W. Jr., the boy, um, the Connecticut Yankee who they fobbed off as a Texas rancher. You know, it's a ranchette, okay? It wasn't a ranch, it was a ranchette. During his administration, during his eight years, it was the best political climate for nuclear power in the United States. And how much money, how much private capital was attracted by nuclear power? Not a dime, okay? It was capitalism that killed nuclear power. It's too risky, too crazy, too dangerous. And, I mean, we don't even have languages that are older than 10,000 years. If you have nuclear waste, you gotta have some kind of messaging that 100,000 years from now, people will be able to understand. Huh? Really? What? You know? Jimmy Carter, remember people, oh, Jimmy Carter, yeah. Yeah, Jimmy Carter implemented energy conservation strategies that while our GDP grew in this eight year period by 27%, our oil use fell 17%, our oil imports dropped 50%, and our imports from the Persian Gulf dropped 87%. It broke the back of OPEC's negotiating strategy because this country is the Saudi Arabia of nega barrels. That is, barrels of oil you don't use because you did conservation, efficiency, caulking the windows and doors, photovoltaic, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that's the way we're gonna go. The cheapest power plant is the one you don't build. You might, you might know about Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville, Florida looked at what Germany does. Germany has a policy, they say, if on your building, home or business, you put so much solar that you're putting more energy back into the grid than you take out, we will pay you a premium price for that energy that comes back in. So Gainesville, Florida didn't have to build a new nuclear power plant or coal plant or whatever. They said to the people, 
if you do this, we'll pay you a premium for net energy back into the grid. They had a two-year sign-up window. It was filled in two months because my house would finally be making money for me instead of me just pouring money into, oh, another door needs replacement, you know. So megawatts, megawatts, the watts you don't use because you turn off the light when you leave the room. You know, I've been in offices where there's a sign above the lights that says, don't leave the room without turning off the lights. And you go and there's nobody there and the lights are on. And these are people with college degrees. You know, it's like, people, wake up, dope slap, you know. Energy retrofits create local jobs, caulking, spray foam, duct sheet metal, all that's made in America. You can't take a building and ship it to China and get it retrofit and then bring it back, okay? This is about local jobs that help the environment and help us save money. Green jobs are growing rapidly uh, during the period 1998 to 2008. In that decade, green jobs in the U.S. grew more than twice as fast as the overall job market and suffered fewer setbacks. New jobs, Kaufman Foundation does a study, and they say virtually all the new net jobs come from small companies that are less than five years old because the big companies are sending more jobs abroad then they create. Their, if you take the Fortune 500, their net job creation in the U.S. is negative. They have destroyed more jobs. Each ATM replaces two tellers. I'm not against ATMs. I use them. But, hey, let's train those people to do it. Let's just dump them out on the street, you know. Five t uh, the top five clean tech job creating sectors, if you're young or old or whatever, you're looking for a career. Solar, both types of solar, photovoltaic, the electric stuff that's sexy. And actually, the better return on investment is solar thermal, hot water, right? The problem with that is natural gas, which heats most of our water, is real cheap. It's not going to say cheap forever, right? Because it's getting more expensive. Biofuels, the U.S. Air Force flew an A-10 attack aircraft on 100% biofuel made from camelina. It's a weed. It's not a food crop. They didn't have to re-engineer the engine at all, and it was 100% biofuel. So check it out. The military, there's a book called The Greening of the U.S. Military. Base commanders realize if my base is independent of the grid because of renewable energy and efficiency, if the grid goes down, my base keeps functioning. The Navy is getting electricity from mud. They figured out a way to wire mud and get microwattage. The Army is developing boots that when you walk, the squishy soles recharge the battery pack so the radio guys don't have to carry a big battery. Yeah? And they got money. They got budget. Thank you, American taxpayers. Wind energy. Wind energy is the one that's just cranking, and it's, it's going to keep cranking. And there's a lot of small wind now, not just all the big, you know. Environmental consulting groups. These are friends of mine who they go to a company and they say, look, we'll go through and develop a sustainability plan for your company. You pay us half the money we save you. Or you give us the first year of savings. I got a buddy that's got, he's got a great scam. It's not a scam. It's, it's a legitimate consulting business. He focuses on bars and restaurants. They use most of their electricity at night. They don't know that most utilities, at least a lot of utilities like PG&E, they have a night rate. That's cheaper than the nine to five day rate to encourage people to run your washing machine and dryer at night instead of during the day and all that. So he gets the contract with the company saying he gets half of whatever he saves them. As soon as the contract is signed, he calls up the utility and says, I want the night rate for this enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> Their bill drops down. He's got a check coming in, right? <laughs> so what I focus on is platforms for building unity. You folks know what to do when you come to an event like this. You know how to introduce yourself. Here's my business card. Want to sleep together? You know, all that kind of stuff, <laughs> right? I said sleep. I didn't say anything about sex. See, you guys, that's, you got to own that. That's, that's in your head. So the challenge is how to unify, how to unify all the, the, here's the big myth of humanity. Alan Watts wrote a great book about this called The Book on the taboo against knowing who you are. And he says, because our sensory apparatus is contained within a bag of skin, we think of ourselves as this bag of skin. I'm, I'm this, you know, and the ego, right? And everything else is other. And that's wrong. It's just factually incorrect. By the sound of my voice, I can change the chemistry in your brain. Hmm? We know that if I do an act of kindness toward this gentleman, 
his serotonin levels go up. It's a neurotransmitter, 80% of which is in your gut, aids digestion, but it gives you a feeling well-being. You know, it's like, you know, that first big hit you take and you're, oh yeah, that, I remember that Woodstock, 1969. Yeah, it was awesome. You know, serotonin makes you healthy and you can generate it in other people, but when I say, when I do an act of kindness to him, you know, oh, your hat is nice or, you know, whatever, some, some throwaway compliment, his serotonin levels go up, my serotonin levels go up, and anyone who sees that act of kindness, it's why you cry with those stupid AT&T commercials with Grandpa calling the kid at Christmas, oh, Grandpa, I miss you, and I'm crying. I'm like, what the f***? Why am I crying? You know, because we resonate, we co-penetrate each other. We're not separate units. And you can prove this to yourself that you have a very distinct inside-outside. You're swallowing spit all day long. When you have a sore throat, you realize, mm, oh, God, I wish I didn't swallow so much. Take a glass of water, <laughs> spit into it, and then go to drink it. And you'll go, it's the same spit you're swallowing all day long. But you've redefined it as external to you. You're jogging. Next time you're jogging or doing something and you go to spit, stop yourself and make, you, make yourself swallow the spit. It's not even left your mouth. But because you've redefined it as expectorant, it's hard to swallow it, right? So we have this very... So you've got to break down that inside-outside stuff, right? So the, the reason for platforms is... We're into biomimicry, imitate nature. Mother Nature's the home team. She's been here for billions of years. We're recent. We're like 200,000 years old at best. So nature's core principle is unity of diversity. Unity of diversity. We talk about diversity, but yeah, unity of diversity. Not a bunch of people fighting with each other over resource distribution, but unity of diversity. So we created the Green Festival 10 years ago. This is our 10th anniversary. Happy to say we're expanding to New York and L.A. this year. San Francisco Green Festival is November 16th, uh, November 12th, 13th. Pardon me. Uh, brain lapse. L.A. Green Festival is uh, October 29th, 30th. It's going to rock at the convention center. And what happens is tens of thousands of people get together and kind of make love with their clothes on, you know? Like... <laughs> People get high, not from smoking out in the parking lot, but because of what they see going on, that we're creating the foundation of the next economic system, an, a system that is in tune with nature and loves all living things. So the idea of Green Mart, this is a limited liability co company here in California that I started years ago. It's been sitting on a shelf, and the idea is to build off the Green Festival and create permanent Green Festival, Green Mart, Eco Mall. If you go to any city in the U.S. and say, where's your green everything store where I can see all the green products? That doesn't exist. And that's so overdue because th there's all these green products, right? There's a proliferation of them. At the Green Festival, we tightly filter only the best companies and the best products. So the idea is Green Mart, you don't need 300 companies. You need 70 or 60 or 40, right? As long as there's an organic baby clothes store and a good shoe store and, uh, 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 and then events at night with singers and hip hop and poetry slams. So what we're doing is we're reinventing enterprise. We're taking the master's tool and we're taking down the master's house with the master's own tool. We're redefining free enterprise away from freedom of big corporations to do whatever they want to people and planet to the freedom of everyone to be enterprising. The freedom of everyone to be enterprising. The current system of monopoly, bank, control, etc., casino, you know how long the average stock is held in ownership? Less than 10 seconds. Less than 10 seconds. Because it's all computerized algorithms just switching the stuff around. That doesn't create one tube of toothpaste, okay? It doesn't create one pair of shoes. It's bad. So the idea of Green Mart is to combine enterprise and education, just like the Green Festival. The enterprise component pays for the education part, because education is hard to fund. So this is our plan. This is just a massing drawing. This is our plan for a vacant lot in San Francisco. My office actually sits right over here, and my window looks right out at that vacant lot. It's owned by the school district. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create real estate templates. You know, what would open source real estate development look like? 
right? Open source real estate development, where you create real estate models that can be replicated anywhere. Because I'm not going to do the one in Rio or Johannesburg. People there are going to do that. But what we want to do is develop the systems, the spreadsheets, the technology. How do you treat, how do you bioremediate all your gray water and black water on site? Like Sean, my favorite architect in the whole world, he says, dude, if we could, if we could bioremediate our solid waste, we could say, we not only know our shit, we sell our shit. Because right? this is a good fertilizer, right? Once it's detoxified. So the idea is uh, a teaching farm, uh, producing crops, producing vegetables and stuff for the food court of the building. Teachers, why teachers? Because the land is owned by the school district. Teachers are your best social multiplier. If you educate teachers about green economy and saving the environment, boosh, you get great multiplier. And the children of today, the children in grade school now, are going to be running the world when the shit hits the fan environmentally. If we don't train them upright, shame on us. We've really got a big responsibility to get these kids trained right. So the idea is eco mall on the bottom, teacher housing above. Every city, every school district in Oakland right now, they're shutting down a bunch of schools because of the demographics, right? So there's a lot of property available. So I'm working on a three-piece real estate model. One is eco-industrial park out on the industrially zoned part of, part of the city. Every city has vacant buildings, vacant land, factories that went to China. All the stuff like the compostable takeout containers, the cardboard cuffs that go around, the coffee cups, all that stuff can be produced locally from local uh, salvage materials. The rural property that's part of this is a combination working farm, teaching farm, retreat center for the urban groups and the green companies to do things like this, an eco-university training camp to train people in nonviolent social change, green career skills, et cetera, and an intentional retirement community for us baby boomers, right? Because what are your alternatives? Live alone, right? I mean, it's why, it's why the eco-village intentional community movement started, because people don't want to live alone. They don't want to be in a golf course community in Phoenix. They don't want to be a burden on their biological children, right? They want to do something more interesting. And then the third piece is the urban mix of commercial, residential, eco-mall plus teacher housing. Now think about the way you can link these three pieces, right? You can grow raw materials out on the farm that get processed into products in the eco-industrial park that get sold or used in the commercial residential building downtown. What we need to be thinking about is when this economy continues to crash, and it will, all empires crash, that you can see a million symptoms of the U.S. empire crashing right now, right? It's not going to get fixed by the people who are dependent on the military industrial complex writing them big fat checks. They're not going to fix it. They're locked into it. You know, I, I have friends who are, you know, I do fundraising, so I have some rich friends who I go to get money from. And I can tell you, they're nice people, but they're not going to fix it. It's, it's got to come from us, right? So the idea is to create a three-piece real estate model that could be the basis of a whole new economy, wherever, in whatever part of the world. Green Guardians is, uh, the idea is neighborhood-based solutionaries trained in green community development skills, energy efficiency, recycling, composting, tree planting, urban agriculture, mostly youth green enterprise. You know, if you can't raise money for youth green enterprise, you're a pretty shitty fundraiser. Um, and so, and there's a safe streets element, like, San Francisco, we got youth gangs. If you talk to those youth, the reason they're in those gangs, it's not because they want to do violence, it's because they want to belong to something. People b need to be in a social network. So Green Guardians also will be an alternative to ROTC. We have a big controversy in San Francisco, high school, ROTC, military. Leftists all go, ah, it's bullshit, we shouldn't have that. Yeah, but the kids, when you talk to the kids, they say, hey, I like belonging to ROTC. I get out of class. I get credit for it. We get to march around. I get a uniform. So Green Guardians would be like the guardian angels, the guys with the red braids, you know, tough guys, safe streets. You take out the macho and you put in green, right? But there is a safe streets element, too, because five or six kids walking down the street with nice shirts, jackets, and hats, you're not going to mess with them, right? And it's replicable anywhere. And this website, greenguardians.ning.com, I'll give you my, e my email, is just kevin at globalexchange.org. If you send me 
an in, uh, a request to get invited into Green Guardians. I'll send you an invitation to it. It's got uh, the site has 233 green training videos, how to do worm bin composting, how to install solar, how to buy uh, safe products for the home, all the blah, 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 in nine different green career categories. We have all the green job search engines hot linked. We have free downloadable green job reports. We want it to be like the central website and it's, it's a social media, social networking website. So you have your own my page, you can load in videos, whatever. It's to help link people up. Redefining waste. Landfills are filling up. So the profitability of salvage economic models, taking stuff out of the waste stream and making products, that's going to intensify. San Francisco is going to have to move its landfill another 100 miles further away from the city because our current landfill is filling up. That means more gas and time trucking it out to wherever, et cetera. I'm proud to say San Francisco is number one in the nation. Our diversion rate of, of resources into recycling and composting is at 77 percent. 77 percent. Most cities are like 10, 15. I was just in Paris. They're probably at two. There was like no recycling. I'm like, come on, it's Paris, you know. Give me a break. Urban mining, extracting precious metals. We throw away 40,000 cell phones a day on average. So there are companies now that are taking these and pulling out the silver and the gold. And, and yeah, I know coltan is hard to recycle. You told me already. Uh, plant food from local waste, TerraCycle in New Jersey proved this. Liquid compost, worm poop tea in recycled soda bottles. They've now got 100 products made from garbage. They're in Walmart, Home Depot, Target, all these stores selling products made from garbage. Tom Sackey, the guy who started it, 24-year-old college dropout. Gourmet mushrooms, back to the roots in, in uh, Oakland, figured out that you could go around the neighborhood, collect coffee grounds from the cafes, and grow gourmet mushrooms and sell those mushrooms back to the restaurants where you're getting coffee grounds from. There's another company in England that does it. They call it, what do they call it? Cardboard, cardboard to caviar. They collect cardboard, they mulch it and turn it into food, and the fish eat it, and they end up with caviar that they go back to the restaurants that they got the cardboard from, and you know. Very smart. Uh, in San Francisco, the city trucks come around, biofuel trucks come around to restaurants to collect the grease and they make biofuel out of it. That grease used to get dumped down in the sewers and we'd spend about $7 million a year cleaning that crap out because it, it gunks up, it solidifies, right? Uh, all sorts of stuff being created, furniture, light fixtures, desks, from stuff taken out of the garbage, right? Uh, we call it resource recovery. At the Green Festival in Seattle back in May, we hit 99% resource recovery. San Francisco, we hit about 98%. And that's with volunteer labor, one staff, one paid staff, and the rest all volunteers. So it can be done. In LA, this group, uh, Green Aid, they put seed bombs in gumball machines. <laughs> Right? It's local seeds. It gets kids into doing guerrilla gardening. Schools, churches, companies can install these. So vacant lots, you know, uh, you know there's, there's soil around a little bit you know, in the city. The key is organizing. In this book we did, Building the Green Economy, we went around looking at success stories. And the key uniting factor was People got organized. They had a problem and they said, let's fix it. My mother and father were uneducated peasants, right? I never saw anxiety on their faces. When something was wrong, they just fixed it, you know? It's, a, it's like a farmer mentality. Oh, it's wrong. What are you going to, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> fix it. That's what you're going to do. Life's rough. Get a helmet, you know? <laughs> so what's going on is science and spirituality are coming together, right? When you act in a kind, generous of spirit way towards somebody, you, you increase the positive chemicals in them and yourself and anyone who observes that. If you're mean and nasty, it produces cortisol, and cortisol undermines your immune system and makes you sick and you die sooner, okay? <laughs> so it's up to you, folks, you know. There is no them, it's just us, just us, justice, just us, justice, just us, justice, justice. 
it's the same structure in your mouth when you say justice and just us. There is no them. If your ideology has a them in it, you need to go back and, and do a little more work. So we have to become good ancestors. We are ancestors, right? We just don't realize it. So if you look at the cathedrals in Europe that took 400 years to build, the masons who laid the foundation layer knew that they would not see the final product of their work. But they also knew they had to do very solid, precise work because of all the weight that was going to come on top of their work. That's us. We're laying the foundation of a future sustainable planet that will have no starving children. Right now, there's a child dying every three seconds from bad water. Just bad water. There's a child dying every three seconds. I'm sorry. That pisses me off. I raised two children. I was there when the baby came out and held it and saw my tears falling on that baby. And I, I can't do a thing of my kids. Those are not my, all the children of the planet are my kids. And we need to start thinking and acting politically as if they were our kids. If somebody, something was threatening one of my two daughters, I'd give up my life without even thinking about it. And I'm sure a lot of you who are parents or who have been parents know what that feeling is. The kid's got a nosebleed in the middle of the night. Oh, I got to get up. Yeah, yeah, you just do it, right? So people say, oh, Kevin, you're talking about a global revolution. You're talking about saving humanity from itself. Dude, that's such a big project. People don't get, people, <laughs> yeah, okay. I grant you that. People don't get excited by small ideas, okay? People get excited by big ideas. And it's about having some sense of plan and enough heart to do it. Not to do the whole thing, but to get it started and then hand it off. It's a relay race, right? So here's why I think we can do this. We do, we, at Global Exchange, we do rea what we call reality tours, which is a great name because when the bus breaks down in the middle of East Bumfuck somewhere, you say, it's a reality tour. <laughs> you know? Oh, there's no hot water in the hotel? You got a good story to tell when you get home. It's a reality tour. So we're down in Haiti. We're in a rural area of Haiti, very poor area. And we're up in a shack up in the mountains, this airless shack that one of the guys, he was an editor from Philadelphia, not rich, but well off. He can't sleep. It's still dark out. He gets out, up. He has got to get some air. He goes out and sits on the front porch. And you know that feeling where you feel somebody's looking at you? He turns around. There's these two little Haitian kids looking around the corner of the building at him. And he beckons them over, and they come over. And he doesn't speak Creole. They don't speak English. But he's got a notebook. And he starts drawing pictures and hand signals. They start to communicate and develop a rapport. One of the kids says something in Creole to the other kid, and they both, oh, yeah, great idea. And they take him by the hand, and they start leading him down this path that goes up the side of this hill. The guy was a white guy and liberal, didn't think he had a racist bone in his body. He starts to get scared, like, these kids are going to put me in a pot and cook me, you know? <laughs> All that Tarzan stuff, right? Their big brothers could be waiting to jump me, you know? And... So he's freaking out, not only because they're taking him further away up this hill, away from where we're all still asleep, and it's dark, right? So, you know, everybody's afraid of the dark. And, but he's also scared because there's all this racism that he didn't know he owned, and it's freaking him out. And he's actually thinking of just, like, pulling away from these kids and running away. The kids are, like, five, six years old, right? <laughs> he gets to a point where he's just totally freaked out, and he's ready to split from them, and they get to the top of the hill. And the kids turn them around facing east. It's an east-west valley. The sun is just cresting the horizon, and shafts of light are shooting through the trees, and it's bringing all the birds to song. And the guy said it was the most beautiful physical image he had ever seen or heard. And he looked down at these two kids, and they were looking up at him with these huge smiles on their faces because they knew what they had done. When this guy told us the story, we were all crying like babies. So think. These little penniless, shoeless children reached across the global class structure and changed the heart forever of somebody from a totally different part of the world in every way. And that guy will never be the same. If those little kids can do that, then we can go out and we can make a global values revolution, right? Right? right. right. So, so here's the image I want to leave you with, the Titanic. 
The corporate economic model is the Titanic. It has hit the iceberg of unsustainability and it is sinking. All the symptoms. Greece is bank. What do you mean Greece is bankrupt? Don't, don't, wait, oh, yeah, let's let the banks run. Anybody here raised in a Christian household? Okay, Jesus was the granddaddy of nonviolence, okay? But he did get violent one time. One time. Did he pick kings or tax collectors or soldiers? No, he picked bankers. Bankers, because they were defiling God's house. Who runs the world right now? Bankers. Are they defiling God's house? You bet. So I'm less violent than Jesus. I, I'm not saying throw their shit on the floor and whip them with a rope, right? I'm saying turn the World Bank into a daycare center or something, you know. So think. The Titanic is sinking. We have two options for our politics. We can run around the decks with protest signs. This boat sucks! And I'm a professional at that. We, when we do protests at Christmas, I always rent a Santa Claus outfit, because if you're chaining yourself to the store or a company's entrance, cops don't want to put handcuffs on Santa with all the cameras around. Think about it. So it's okay to get arrested if you, wrote the, if you wrote the script and you decided to get arrested, it's okay to get arrested. My kids would always say, is mommy in jail again, daddy? They'd hear me on the phone. <laughs> Lawyers bail, you know, is mommy in jail again? So the Titanic is sinking. The two options are, this boat sucks, we protest. Or we get busy building the next boat, a solar-powered, wind-powered boat, party on deck, scantily clad people with drinks in their hand, dancing to cool music. We pull up alongside the Titanic, and people will jump willingly to the new boat. <laughs> and I leave you, you remember the prime directive of Star Trek? It was don't interfere. The prime directive of this movement is how do we love all the children of all species for all time? How do we love all the children of all species for all time? Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.